Following Watergate and Nixon's resignation in the 1970s, it was difficult to imagine another scandal rocking the executive branch shortly thereafter. But while Watergate was unsavory and Nixon's involvement in the subsequent cover-up inexcusable, the intended infraction of wiretapping Democratic National Headquarters was quite tame. Less than a decade later, President Reagan would become entangled in an affair far more nefarious than simple wiretapping. The Iran-Contra affair violated congressional law, international policy, and for a while appeared that it could potentially unravel the gains of the Reagan Revolution. It was only during the Cold War when the role of National Security Advisor began to be seen as a post significant enough to be a cabinet post, yet not recognized as such by law. McGeorge Bundy had helped JFK negotiate through the diplomatic treachery of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Henry Kissinger had helped Nixon fortify the 1970s as the decade of detente. And Zbigniew Brzezinski had convinced Carter that aiding the Mujahideen could potentially deal a decisive blow to the Soviet Union. So in a sense, it was not surprising that when Robert McFarlane, Reagan's NSA advisor, approached the president with a harebrained scheme to aid a moderate faction in Iran while simultaneously funding the Contras of Nicaragua, the president, or the at the very least his people, listened. Schooled in the clandestine arts, CIA director Bill Casey also helped weave the intricate web. Just about halfway through the Reagan presidency, Secretary of the Treasury Donald Reagan, who came to Washington after serving as chairman and CEO of Merrill Lynch, switched jobs with Chief of Staff James Baker. Reagan, while intimately familiar with the financial markets, did not possess the same familiarity when it came to foreign affairs. Perhaps it was the former financier's lack of diplomatic knowledge and unwillingness to advise against engaging in such legally ambiguous missions that helped sow the seeds of the embarrassment. Ironically, in a sign of what should have been seen as a red flag, Secretary of State George Shultz and Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger were against the scheme from the start. They were skeptical that the American arms would not make their way into the hands of the supporters of Khomeini and thought the entire operation was an unnecessary risk. But while plenty of Reagan underlings were aware of the developments in the Middle East and Latin America, the president would maintain ignorance, with his Teflon presidency remaining intact. Instead of Reagan taking the fall, that responsibility would fall on the shoulders of U.S. Marine Corps Lieutenant General Oliver North. But why take the risk in the first place? Irrationally wary of Soviet expansion in the West and wanting to roll back communism in Latin America as opposed to contain communist influence, the Reagan administration resorted to arming anti-Sandinista Contras in Nicaragua, a counter-revolutionary force established to protect the Central American nation from the growing influence of the social democratic Sandinistas. What makes the Iran-Contra affair so fascinating is its ability to intertwine seemingly unrelated events in various parts of the world into a cohesive, if complex, narrative. Last week, the video lecture regarding American involvement in proxy wars touched on the American military presence in Lebanon, as well as subsequent terrorist attacks on an American embassy in Beirut, as, though, as well as the Marine headquarters at the international airport. Since Reagan's bellicose rhetoric was far different than his predecessor, Jimmy Carter, radical factions in Lebanon were concerned that the United States might engage in a retaliatory strike as a result of the terror attacks. In an effort to prevent against American aggression, Lebanese radicals began a campaign of systematic kidnappings of both Americans and other Westerners. Unlike in Iran a few years earlier, Americans working and living in Beirut were instructed to leave the city, but some did not heed the advice. So while those in Tehran were taken hostage through no individual fault of their own, the hostages in Lebanon were partly responsible for their own imprisonment. Nonetheless, Reagan wanted badly to free the hostages, knowing that such an episode would serve as a huge boost to his political capital. A few hundred miles west of Lebanon, another Middle Eastern conflict was brewing. In the midst of the Iranian Revolution, Iraq, under the leadership of Saddam Hussein, invaded its eastern neighbor. In a war that would last over a decade, in the end, very little territory exchanged hands. American aid initially was provided to Hussein, still justifi justifiably bitter over the 444-day hostage crisis in Iran, the United States was more than willing to aid adversaries of Ayatollah Khomeini and the Islamic Republic. However, American assistance to Saddam Hussein came at a price. Much like other freedom fighters the United States supported in Latin America, who employed unsavory and off often downright murderous tactics, Hussein employed the use of chemical weapons on Iranians, something that had not been seen since the end of World War I. Iran also found itself at an initial disadvantage 
and that its antagonism in the United States had hurt its ability to trade with other Western nations around the world. And with Iraq threatening Iran's eastern border, the Iranians needed weapons and needed them fast. In Nicaragua in the late 1970s, the Somoza dynastic dictatorship was experiencing its final throes. And, while, and following the regime's eventual crumbling, the Sandinista National Liberation Front began to establish social democratic reforms. With Reagan coming to the White House in the early 1980s, American foreign policy shifted dramatically from an approach of containing communist influence to rollback or elimination. However, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, and determined to avoid future costly and lengthy proxy wars, the United States Congress passed the Boland Amendment that strictly outlawed any American financial or military assistance to the anti-Sandinista freedom fighter forces known as the Contras. This complicated the foreign policy of the Reagan administration, considering its desire to eliminate communist regimes, especially those close to American borders. Furthermore, the later decision of the CIA, under the direction of the Reagan administration, to mine Nicaraguan harbors created major congressional kickback, considering it seemed to be a direct violation of the Boland Amendment. Please take a minute to answer the following questions before continuing with the lecture. As is often the case with historical scandals, exposure does not result from a single error, but instead a multitude of mistakes. As with Watergate, Nixon's downfall didn't result from the wiretapping of the DNC headquarters, but a combination of matters such as funneling campaign finances to the burglars, recording conversations in the Oval Office, attempting to obstruct an FBI investigation, and firing someone he personally hired to be an independent prosecutor. But unlike Watergate, which was exclusively a Nixonian effort at fortifying his own political power, the Iran-Contra scandal emerged from an initial desire to rectify either disastrous situations abroad, like the hostage crisis in Lebanon, or helping forces that needed American assistance to prevent socialist influence from spreading in the Western Hemisphere. That being said, the way the Reagan administration's attempts to resolve these situations were illegal, immoral, and murderous. A short time following the conclusion of the Iranian hostage crisis, when the Iran-Iraq war had already commenced, and the situation in Lebanon had been going on for a while, an Iranian businessman approached the Reagan administration, although not the president himself, and offered assistance. The Iranian mentioned that he represented a moderate force inside of Iran that presented an alternative to the autocratic and Islamic regime of the Ayatollah. In the war against Iraq, the Iranian forces, while not necessarily ideologically homogeneous, shared a common enemy. Ever since the beginning of the hostage crisis in late 1978, an American weapons embargo had been in effect in Iran, preventing shipments of American arms to the Middle Eastern nation. Additionally, this Iranian moderate claimed to possess a connection to the individuals who had taken Americans hostage in Lebanon. While unquestionably sketchy, the Reagan administration saw an opening. By providing weapons to the moderate Iranian faction, the United States would effectively be ensuring the balance of power in the Middle East did not fall out of whack, and potentially carry enough favor with the Iranian moderates to get the American hostages released in Lebanon. Technically, or at least this is what the Reaganites let themselves believe, the weapons embargo had been put in place to prevent American armaments from reaching the forces of Khomeini. So by offering the weapons to the moderate Iranians, since they were not intended targets of the embargo, the transaction, while not something that should be celebrated, was tolerable. An old adage reads, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. This means that no matter how much planning goes into something, there are always unexpected factors that can cause derailment. But unfortunately for the Reagan administration, the women's exchange with Iran was not even a well-laid plan. To further exacerbate matters, part two of the weapons exchange involved overcharging Iran for the weapons that were being sold. So for example, if Armament X was sold for $100, the U.S. would inflate the price to $150, thus maximizing profits. However, instead of declaring the $150 in arms sales, only $100 was accounted for. With the remaining money, the U.S., via the CIA, funneled surplus funds to the Nicaraguan Contras fighting against the Marxist Sandinista government. Shadiness was not the only problem with this harebrained scheme. The previous year, Congress had passed the Boland Amendment, which banned any U.S. government funding to the Contras. However, since the surplus dollars from the arms sales were not on the books, so to speak, the money the Contras were receiving looked like it did not even exist. A similar scheme was used by many drug king kingpins to launder money, most famously Colombian drug lord Pablo Escobar, used soccer clubs in Medellin to launder or clean cocaine dollars. 
by selling all tickets for cash only, Escobar could claim more money was spent on tickets than was actually the case. In reality, the difference between the actual gate money and the declared money was substantial, but instead of having to construct some backstory as to where the money came from, Escobar could claim it was a derivative of stadium ticket sales. While this guns for hostages scheme continued to unfold, with the surplus cash being funneled to the Contras, the CIA began to endorse even more radical steps to prevent communist creep in the Western Hemisphere. For years, the Contras had been smuggling cocaine into the United States, much of which ended up being sold on the street as crack. Considering this scheme was taking place at the same time as Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign, there seemed to be a gross lack of continuity between American public policy and American private action, although this scheme was not exposed until the mid-1990s, when San Jose Mercury columnist Gary Webb unearthed the link between the Nicaraguan Contras and the crack cocaine epidemic in Los Angeles. Webb would later argue, with substantiation, that the Reagan administration shielded drug dealers from prosecution in exchange for funding the Contras. Drug laws later in the 1980s also reflected a lack of desire to cut off the supply as opposed to punish users. Thousands were sent to jail for simple possession, while many drug kingpins remained operational. Despite this ridiculous scheme, the operation was not exposed until CIA operative Eugene Hassenfuss was shot down in a plane that had been flying over Nicaraguan airspace. It must be noted that in the 1980s, the official recognized government of Nicaragua was controlled by the Sandinistas, much like the notes that the Watergate burglars helped investigative journalist Woodward and Bernstein make an eventual connection to the White House, materials Hassan Foos possessed at the time of his detention helped journalists connect the dots to Reagan administration involvement. Interestingly, three other individuals died in the crash of Hassan Foos's plane, and Hassan Foos himself only survived because he disobeyed orders and wore a parachute on the covert mission. As you can see from the graphic on the slide, the Iran-Contra affair was a tangled web indeed, and in the end, a scheme that was intended to free American hostages in Lebanon, help the moderate faction gain influence in Iran, and help defeat the Sandinista forces in Nicaragua, turned into a national embarrassment. The Boland Amendment and weapons embargo with Iran were blatantly violated. While some American hostages were freed in Lebanon, others were subsequently taken hostage. The weapons sold to the shady Iranian businessmen turned out to be a ruse, with those armaments instead making their way into the hands of the Ayatollah's forces. And to make matters worse, the crack epidemic that ravaged American cities in the 80s was in part a product of the AS-9 CIA scheme to increase funding to a Central American rebel army. The only thing that remained to be seen was whether or not the president would be held responsible for the catastrophe or others would be the ones to fall on the sword. Please take a minute to answer the following questions before continuing with the lecture. While Nixon did his best to avoid culpability for the Watergate scandal, instead throwing Haldeman, Dean, and others in front of the public outcry, Nixon was ultimately forced to resign. And while his obstruction of justice and dirty tricks were distasteful, compared to the crimes associated with the Iran-Contra affair, Watergate looked like child's play. Oliver North, the Marine Corps lieutenant colonel who was tasked with taking the fall for Iran-Contra's failures, masterfully manipulated his televised congressional hearings into a celebratory spectacle. North admitted to lying to Congress previously about American complicity in providing aid to the Contras, but defended the action, saying it was the right thing to do. This, despite the fact that the Bolin Amendment explicitly prohibited that exact aid. He exposed CIA Director Bill Casey's involvement in the case, while also making public Casey's suggestion to shred documents related to the operation. North also named NSA Advisor McFarlane as a party who had asked for records to be edited to make things appear to have a legal facade when all corresponding actions were clearly not legitimate. But while the Iran-Contra scheme horrified Americans, North himself was seen in a far more favorable light. With CNN still in its early days, reruns of North's testimony made him a national celebrity. Furthermore, North's testimony indirectly began to establish a distinction Reagan had so desperately been trying to solidify between the government and the military. The government was standing in the way of a Contra victory, the government liked to sit in its comfortable chairs and sculpt policy that, while practical in the Washington boardroom, wouldn't get the job done in the real world. North was the maverick, who refused to let the government get in the way of an operation that would free American hostages and fund Latin American freedom fighters. The only problem was, things didn't actually go down that way. While Ford's pardon of Nixon cost the former congressman and short-term VP political credibility, 
Reagan avoided the same mistake by not forgiving those responsible for Iran-Contra. But unlike Nixon, thanks to document shredding and plausible deniability, Reagan could at least claim to be unaware of the scheme from the get-go. And while the president likely did not authorize the scheme to go in motion, chances are, by providing nondescript soundbites like, I want the Contras gone, while not asking about the details, provided subtle enabling. Also, unlike Nixon, who remained unrepentant for his transgressions, Reagan gave a televised address in which he admitted to oversight while not condemning his political credibility. Reagan's humbling himself in front of the American people was refreshing, considering the aloof and arrogant connotation of the American politician. But perhaps most importantly, Reagan was a likable, affable guy, a Teflon president, while Nixon was nothing but a bitter, paranoid, and unapologetic human being. Ford's pardon of Nixon also left the American people without the sense that justice had been served. But while resignations were numerous in the aftermath of Iran-Contra, there was no jail time served for anyone involved, despite gross regard, disregard for congressional law. Hiking taxes as governor of California, liberalizing abortion, endorsing but not abiding by traditional family values, and now the Iran-Contra affair, Ronald Reagan had once again escaped. Please take a minute to answer the following questions.